there's a lot of leadership books out there and we will not shy away from uh, effective leadership knowledge in college textbooks and this and that and the other. Something special about this course is that we look at leadership from a Quranic perspective. How did Allah frame leadership in our deen? How did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu frame it? How did he, what did he warn about? What, what, how, how did he frame decisions? In some respects, you know, such as professionalism, excellence, trying to, you know, pursue outside, this can be similar to leadership training for uh, an executive in an American corporation or leadership training from an, a, 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 a Western academic lens. In other respects, there are important differences on how leadership is cast Islamically, specifically in terms of its spiritual impact, in terms of the ability of power to corrupt, and how the Qur'an deals with that. How do I wield leadership while not losing myself and my heart? That is really important to learn. A lot of Muslims do not model this leadership well. That could be from ignorance. That could be from the fact that uh, a lot of Muslim lands uh, are, are, are engrossed in challenging political situations. It could be from... Um, you know, just our immaturity in Islamic institutions, but ineffective leadership harms a lot, and effective leadership amplifies benefits. So we want to understand that very well. Number two is going to be to integrate leadership best practices and lived experience into individual Dawa leadership. What that means is we want to uh understand in the prophetic model in the model of great leaders how does that translate to me myself sister aisha brother ahmed sister fatima brother yusuf whoever you are how does that translate into what you are doing right because the responsibilities of leadership are not just for kings and presidents and you know the, the heads of organizations each of us as we will learn has an element of islamic religious leadership that is entrusted to us this will include what are called tangible practices that promote intangible outcomes i know these are kind of big and abstract words we're going to get into this so don't be overwhelmed this is like the whole course summarized in a couple points what that means is the leader leader should have, um, you know, uh, uh, humility. They should have ihsan, excellence in what they do. They should have um, other Islamic characteristics, tawakkul, trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are intangible moral and ethical outcomes. I can't measure your heart and tell you whether they're there or not. But they translate into tangible things that promote them. In other words, a measure of, you know, working with Ihsan is high quality output, for example. A measure of humility includes regular presence in a salah and the acts of worship alongside others. These other things are very specific things that now you can hold yourself accountable to as a leader. And again, one of the reasons this is so important is because effective leadership requires power and authority to do something. But power corrupts the human condition. And Muslims are not exempt from that. And so these spiritual tools, they help protect us, shield us, uh, uh, as we wield this leadership that Allah has commanded. Number three is to assess individual growth and development as measured against Islamic principles and best practices. What that means is as a leader, you should not stop doing what puts you in that leadership responsibility in the first place, growing in your relationship with Allah, having that strong foundation, uh, going back to the basics. And so we will promote that and look at how the Prophet ﷺ as a leader 
still cleared time and invested in essentials like his relationship with Allah, like his extra worship and prayers, like his time with family and so on and so forth. Fourth, we'll be analyzing the characteristics of historical and contemporary leaders and extracting helpful elements to bring into your own leadership. What that means is looking at the Prophet as a leader, looking at leaders today, studying their models, understanding what you can do, uh, and bringing it into your own leadership. Number five is to distill and apply select best practices in personal time and project management to the Dawah context. What that means is in this class, we're going to take the tip of the iceberg, the cream of the crop, if you will, on some essentials of Dawah, of, of time management and of project management. To be clear, those can be courses in and of themselves. And maybe some of you that have other professional responsibilities and you know get into more intricate project management, you may take that training uh, outside of the scope of this course. Here, we're really going to be focusing more on typical nonprofit contacts in Dawa uh, that allow events, programs, and so on that level to be done well, because when they're not, it impacts the Dawah. In fact, even when the message is sound, when the delivery is not strong, it brings the message further from the heart. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we will learn, he commanded his Prophet sallam, not only to speak the truth, but to try to speak well with excellence in various parts of the Quran, and it's also affirmed by the Hadith. And so that is part of us trying to be effective leaders, not only doing the right thing, but doing it in a beautiful and effective way. Finally, number six, every learning of sacred knowledge should be for the purpose of tahqiq al ubudiyya In other words, realizing, realization of worshiping Allah by acquiring and applying beneficial knowledge, ultimately in a way that's pleasing to him. So in all of this, yes, we are trying to serve people, become better better leaders, carry this responsibility. But the core why of all of this is it's a part of our ibadah and worship of Allah. And we don't want to lose sight of that. We want to appreciate that and be clear on that, that uh, um, to help, inshallah, seek to make this pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jal, and in a way that Allah accepts it, so that this is a beneficial, praiseworthy uh, 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 act, uh, seeking, inshallah, his pleasure and the high ranks of his believers. So those learning outcomes, again, are on the syllabus. I wanted to explain to you a little bit about the why of how these come together. I know these are big ideas. Do not be uh, uh, concerned or overwhelmed if any one of those needs a little more detail and so on. We're going to essentially be breaking them down the entire course. But as we go through it, inshallah, um, certainly we'll, we'll have time for questions and discussion together. I want to pause here, inshallah, and check. We've looked at the 30,000 foot level of this course, what's expected. Um, I also want to say in terms of expectations, it will be very helpful uh, for anyone that is able to, inshallah, this course is a very interactive course. We're going to have what are called breakout rooms. We're going to challenge ourselves in this course. A lot of Muslims are, uh, you know, affected by poor leadership. Poor leadership messes stuff up. You know what drives me nuts? Sometimes people say, well, the brother means well, the sister means well. But that is not enough. It's not what our deen asks for. A good heart doing the wrong thing can make a lot of damage. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded that our actions be sincere for his sake. That's a sound heart. But they also be in accordance with the sunnah. And that means that the action is right. Someone can mean well as a leader, but now... When we do wrong and we're individually responsible, it just harms us in any leadership context, in family, in Dawa, and so on, then it affects a lot of people. I want to give you an example. This example is a little bit heavy, but I want you to really taste part of why this is so important, this Dawa leadership. A brother shares a story of his 
uh, a member of his family. It was his his sibling, his 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 brother, and mashallah, the entire family. You know, they were born Muslims, but the person sharing the story, mashallah, was you know regular in their prayers, observant. His brother, they would culturally observe Eid and so on, not not as regular in his prayer, not as practicing. And as you know, mashallah, some of you earlier shared also about one of your goals in da'wah being sharing Islam with your relatives. I know that's a big part of my goal, right? When you have something and recognize that the most precious thing that Allah has given is guidance, deen, Islam, then you love to benefit those that you, you love with it, right? And, it, and it's it's painful. It's a difficult test when for, for a time they may not be as receptive to it, right? And a lot of us, we, we face this test in our time as the Prophet and, and, and many companions did as well in their families. This brother shares that it was the 27th night of Ramadan. And they were having iftar together as an extended family. They finished the iftar. And his brother, he hadn't been to the masjid for many, many, many months. Long time. He didn't used to go regularly. So it was a very emotional night. He said, my brother, it's it's the 27th night. We have to go. We can't, like, if not tonight, then when? He really wanted to encourage him. His brother's like, I don't know, you know. But eventually, he said, okay. They went to the masjid, and they were early. So they sat in a in a in a row waiting for Salat al Aisha. You get what I'm saying at the masjid. Just a couple minutes passed by, and someone tapped him on his shoulder, and he said, "Get up! This is my spot. I've been sitting here. I've been I've been hit this spot for the last twenty days. I don't want somebody else to sit there." So it was the twenty seventh night. They didn't want to make a problem. It's not like there was reserved seats in the masjid, but you know, they got up. Now there were more rows, so they had to go way back. They sat down. As they sat down, it wasn't at then time yet. And then somebody else came and displaced them a second time. So now they were further back waiting for Aisha, although they were earlier than many people. They were in their third spot when someone came and tugged on this man's shirt. Now, I didn't see the shirt, to be clear with you. I don't know what was there. I know for certain it was not vulgar or inappropriate. I don't know if it was colorful or if there was something, but you know, it was not something grossly inappropriate. Maybe or maybe not that it wasn't the best choice for Salah in the way that maybe someone that doesn't go to the masjid regularly would make that mistake, honestly. And this person tugged on his shirt and said, brother, you can't, you can't pray like this. This is not right. In the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave him a telling down. At the end of that encounter, the brother, who's Muslim, right, turned to his brother that encouraged him to go to the masjid, and he said, now do you know why I don't come? Now do you know why I don't come? Why do I share that story with you? I know that story is heavy in many ways. On one hand, effective leadership defines a space moves a community, affects others. So you see that so many of us, mashallah, I even see, you know, our reactions as a classroom. This is not a foreign experience to many of us, right? Sadly, we know, and to be very clear, I am not condemning or, or putting down anybody's heart. The reason is because you don't need a bad intention to make a big problem. If this person intends well, but does not understand that you cannot wield that dawah space in that manner, then they need to step back. And I told you, this class is going to challenge us, right? As we'll see, a hadith of the Prophet wasallam, he speaks to one of the most exceptional companions. This is this hadith of Abu Dhar, we'll talk about it next time, inshallah. But the Prophet ﷺ, in the outcome of the hadith, he told Abu Dhar not to take that position. Not to lead in that way. 
And so if it was good enough for the companions, it's good enough for us. This is not insulting, right? But the leader has to understand when you step into a space, you have to know what you're doing. We're still human beings. We can make mistakes. But if a person is not self-aware of the impacts of what they're going on, how to inform their decisions, then they can step back and go to a leadership place where they are equipped or get the trainer and accountability that they can. So the Prophet Abu Dhar is an amazing companion. Again, I'm forecasting what we're going to talk about next time. But Abu Dhar is one of the most exceptional companions in worship, right? Very distinguished, very spiritual man, very remarkable family, actually, him and his wife. But certain things about his, his, his personality made it so that certain positions were not suited for him. And you see that how the companions were okay with this and receptive to the Prophet ﷺ. Because leadership can be a source of regret and sadness on the Day of Judgment, except for the one that takes it with its due and fulfills what they are required to do in it, as the Prophet ﷺ teaches. So this is not fire and brimstone scaring us from leadership. And, and, and we just said that Dawah leadership is very broad. Many of us are going to wield it. But we want to be conscious in our leadership responsibilities. A big part of this course together is to elevate our consciousness so we can, uh, you know, uh, um, elevate the awareness of people around us as well. A lot of people, sadly, each and every one of those three people from that night, I don't think they know the impact of what they did. There isn't that consciousness because we're human beings. Sometimes we make mistakes, sometimes we apologize, sometimes we make it. But when you're not conscious, that's when a lot of harm can come. On the other hand, the goodness of a heart that Allah entrusts with a leadership responsibility can extend well beyond one person, right? And so while authority and power are not sought after, we don't ask for them in Islam, Naturally, Allah gives believers different responsibilities, right? And the Prophet ﷺ, in describing this, he gives the metaphor of a shepherd. The Prophet ﷺ says, kullukum ra wa kullukum an Each of you is like a shepherd, and each is responsible and will be questioned about his or her flock. The reality of tending sheep is so remarkable in our deen that the Prophet ﷺ indicates. So this is both a reality and a metaphor. That's what I'm trying to say. On one hand, the Prophet ﷺ indicates in the hadith that every prophet sent by Allah Tended sheep, literally, not as a metaphor. Actually, when the companions heard this hadith from the Prophet, the younger companions were surprised because they did not know a period of his life where he had worked as a shepherd. And the Prophet taught in the hadith that he had tended the sheep of the people of Mecca for qaradit, which is like pennies, very small wages as a younger man. So every prophet sent by Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the tending of sheep or working as a shepherd as part of their divine training and preparation. And then in leadership, the prophet uses the metaphor of the shepherd. Meaning what? Meaning that the father and the mother are like a shepherd of their home, their leaders. Uh, they're leaders of those responsibilities. They're leaders of those relationships. They're leadership for their children. That is a very real and defining form of leadership. MashaAllah, some of you shared that you are teachers, teachers in school or in you know weekend schools or halakat or youth group leaders. That is a massive responsibility of Islamic leadership. And I'm lifting this up because so many of us in our times we don't treat these as big deals. These are very big deals. This will literally define Islam and shape hearts 
for years and years to come. That is a wonderful opportunity for great reward. It is also something to be cautious, not to bring in, you know, sins or accountability from a lack of consciousness of that. And part of our challenge, you know, especially in North American culture, we're a very celebrity obsessed culture. So sometimes as Muslims too, we think that the leader, right, if not the president of the country or the king of the kingdom, we think that it's the board or it's the executive director or it's the president of the nonprofit or it's the principal of the school. And I know and respect that some of you may serve in these positions or may have served in those positions. We ask Allah, to grant you tawfiq, it is an important form of leadership. It is not the only form of leadership. To be specific, leadership is, is different from a title, right? It's not just the senior most position. Each of these are very meaningful forms of leadership. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this in several places in the Holy Quran. Among them, what we will examine today, insha'Allah, is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surat As-Sajda. And I'm sharing the screen here for your convenience. Surat As-Sajda is Surah number 32, verse number 24. Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا لَمَّا صَبَرُوا and we raised from among them leaders, guiding by our command. When, and Allah mentioned some qualities of leadership, when they used, to, when they were patient, sabr uh, here, patience, constancy, steadfastness. They had firm belief and uh, in our uh, signs in our ayat. So you see here, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions his favor in raising from among the people leaders. And the positive impact that those leaders have is rooted in several Quranic attributes of leadership. Inshallah, that'll be our next discussion. Where we talk about a sabr, al yaqeen the Qur'anic pillars of effective leadership, and there are other characteristics as well that Allah mentions elsewhere in the Qur'an. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws our attention to the fact that, the, in this case, speaking about the nation's past and the meaning extends to our nation, that Allah raised leaders that brought about this positive impact. The questions that we will ask, how were these leaders described? And what did they achieve? And how did they protect themselves against the pressures of people and so on? This metaphor of the shepherd, I have to be cautious here. I'm not suggesting that people are like sheep, but that the skills of clearly of tending sheep, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected them as part of the emotional intelligence and skills and preparation of his prophets. Sometimes these metaphors they can be a little bit more distant for us because we may not be as close to the creation of Allah. We're surrounded by the fabrication of man. If you ever even visited a farm or speak to someone that's close to that, you know, in cartoons or in our imagination, if you will, you imagine that sheep are like remote controls. You'd say something and it all happens, right? One of the remarkable things about sheep as animals is that they display very individual tendencies. So one approach does not unify the flock. Some sheep, they need an element of firmness. Sometimes you see the Prophet Sallallahu for example, in Dawah, the way he approached Umar ibn al-Khattab was different from the way he approached Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Sayyidina Abu Bakr perhaps was a more, you know, uh, he was deeply wise and, and intellectual, very close to the Prophet I had a particular approach with him. Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab, again, this relationship is culturally appropriate at that time. It's it's from a pre-existing relationship, but as Sayyidina Umar struggles with it, the Prophet I said, takes a very firm approach with him. Not violating his thing, but being very direct with him. And Sayyidina Umar, 
that worked really well with his personality, this decisiveness, this clarity, right? While not violating the boundaries of Allah, of course. The sheep, that metaphor is very similar. And you know, when you teach in a classroom, you know that it's not a one size fits all with every child. When you're responsible for a youth group, you understand that you may have pre prepared the best curriculum for that day, but you need to be aware that those children are not coming in as blank slates to that halaqah. And if, that, if a child amongst them is carrying something really heavy from home or really heavy from their lives, that's probably going to need to factor into your thoughts so that the message lands on the heart. It's not just a, a download from the internet onto their heart and mind. So in da'wah also, the, the hearts have different keys. Simply having the information and lobbing it over, if you will, does not promote positive outcomes. Human beings, they have to internalize, struggle, make it their own, consider and convince themselves in order to do that, it takes an understanding of psychology, a deep understanding of the religion and different ways to express it. And ultimately, these leadership competencies. And it takes characteristics like what we're talking about, sub patience. You know, the, the wolf eats from the lone sheep. So a person that easily holds grudges, alienates, makes it about them instead of someone else, takes every insult super personally, is not ready for the rigors of the road, even if they're not searching for the fight. The Prophet ﷺ was not seeking a fight or a difficulty, but he was tested along the way and people called him names. People did wrong by people rejected for years that then would accept and become the most incredible of people. They would have never had that chance if it were not the breadth of his heart, the openness of his spirit then they would have never tasted that chance. And the metaphor of the shepherd, these are some foundational concepts about Islamic leadership that we want to internalize. The metaphor of the shepherd is from the most essential teachings about leadership in Islam. That a person that is tending that flock needs to understand that every member of their flock has their individual needs, has a key to their heart. Sometimes it's not the right time or place for a certain message. Wisdom is to place it in that. It's, it's okay if the information is right, but wisdom is to make it in the right context. And a true leader protects, guards, nurtures, cares for the flock. So those realities come to leadership as well. Part of leadership is guarding and protecting others. Part of it is serving and caring for others. Dr. Rafiq Bikun and uh, Dr. Jamal Bedoui mentioned these two hallmarks of servant leadership and guardian leadership. Again, extracting so much from the metaphor of the shepherd. So I know we've talked about a lot of big ideas today. This class is meant to challenge you. We're going to have a lot of case studies. So today, I want you to be aware that we want to spend more time getting to know one another and also that we're putting a big umbrella. So if some of the concepts or words that I mentioned are new or need more explanation, um, inshallah, I want to assure you that we're going to have plenty of time to get more specific. And then actually, we're going to be doing case studies in this class as a, as, a, as a class where we break up and actually I've given you real life scenarios. Of course, I've changed the names so they're not identifiable. It's nothing that any of you would recognize from so on and so forth, but real life scenarios about challenges in a classroom or dawa issues or a college dawa scenario and so on to simulate a lot of what you talked about i'm going to invite you to solve these complex problems so at through repetition and through study together inshallah we pray to allah that these teachings will come closer to our hearts